everyone, my name is Joyce Lynn. For the last seven years, I worked at Postman. Who here has heard of Postman? Okay, if you're at an API talk, you probably have heard of Postman. For the last seven years, can you still hear me? For the last seven years, I've lived and breathed APIs. I think about APIs, I see APIs everywhere. They're the pipelines that allow us to gather data, transform it, and then share it. A few months ago, I joined a robotic startup called Vium, and I'm still working with APIs, but I'm reimagining what you can do when you can connect those APIs to things in the physical world. So what happens when you have sensors to collect data, algorithms and insights to actuate physical machines? And in this session, I'm going to ask you to reimagine what you can do in your everyday lives and your jobs with these very, very fundamental and simple but powerful building blocks. Like Databricks' Statement Execution API. Who has used this API before? Oh, very nice, very nice. Only two hands. So we'll go over a gentle introduction to this API. We'll walk through an example of how we can use the API to create our own automation, which is right now, I'm going to say, you might not see it live, but I have a recording just in case. Uh, and then we'll see how to generate code to set up and run our automation in any programming language. All right, so before we start with the API, Databricks has a ton of ways to connect to your data besides specific partner integrations for third-party tools there's other methods of natively connecting to your data, like a command line interface, SDKs for Python, Go, and Node, drivers for ODBC and JDBC, and that last one there is what we're going to be talking about. It's the SQL Statement Execution API. So with the REST API, you don't need to install drivers. You're going to be making a call over HTTP. So you can use this to integrate with other internal tooling you have or other third-party tools that you don't already have an integration for, or you're building your own custom data applications. Let's look at the API. It's a very simple, modest API. It's three endpoints. The first one is going to be to submit your SQL statement, and you'll retrieve a unique statement ID. The next one is to check the status of your query and retrieve the results. And the last one is to cancel it, and we may need to use that last one, just depending on how the live demo portion goes. So you have three endpoints, and you also have three modes for execution. The default execution mode is going to be um, some payload where you have a property called wait timeout. And wait timeout says to the query, in this example, wait 15 seconds, and then continue asynchronously. These are actually the most powerful. If you remember nothing from this entire talk, please remember this. Um, and then you'll get back a unique statement ID right away, and you'll use that statement ID to check the status of your query and fetch your results. Asynchronous, you're going to set wait timeout to zero seconds to immediately kick off your query asynchronously. You'll retrieve a statement ID right away, and then you can use it to retrieve results at whatever cadence you want. It's a non-blocking action. And the last one is synchronous. If you only want your query to run synchronously, you will set wait timeout to the total time that you want to wait. So you can retrieve your results in that same call. Otherwise, it will cancel once that time period comes to an end. So there's three execution modes for submitting a SQL query. Let's take what we've learned about this API and try to set up our own automation. OK, so this part's that's a little risky. We'll see if this can work. Uh, let's see. OK, can everyone see that all right? All right, so I'm in a public workspace. If you have your phone out or your machine out, you can go here and follow along. But I'm in a public workspace with one collection. And if I open up the first folder, there is a tutorial that's very well documented by the Databricks team, which shows you how to execute a SQL statement. And if you look at the body, it's pretty simple. There's a lot of additional parameters you can include, but the thing that we're looking at here is the statement. It's SQL wrapped in a string, submitted as a property statement. So this is how you, let's see if this works. I'm going off of conference Wi-Fi and I have a machine going off of my phone hotspot. 
Okay. So you can see that immediately you get back a statement ID. Let me pull it up so you can see it in the back. This is the response here at the bottom. You can see your statement ID, status of your query, it succeeded. And you can also take a look at the other metadata. So if you have a very large result, you'll be looking at the chunks. And it's similar to pagination if you're familiar with then scrolling or walking through different chunks of data. And then you have your check execution status. Here's that same re retrieving your results. Fetch large results as we mentioned with the chunks. And then cancel, just in case something's taking a little bit longer than you think it will, you can go ahead and cancel it. Okay, so a couple of things is I was able to open this collection and spin it up and set it right away, but what are you gonna need before you can send an API call? What, I can't hear anything. This is a terrible idea for me to ask you questions, but you'll need to authorize your API calls. So the one thing that I will say is that in your uh, Databricks dashboard, you will be able to generate a token. And let me hide my token from you people, you very gracious people that will not cause any mischief. Um, and you can see that I've saved this here as a couple different variables. So of course, you're gonna need your host, your warehouse ID, and your access token that you generate from your dashboard. One thing I will tell you about in Postman is that it's very important that you understand the difference between initial value and current value. I'm here in a public workspace. If you go there right now on your phone, you can only see initial values, okay? This is, initial values is how you share variables with your team and with the public. I explicitly, I just leaked my secrets to you guys, but everyone else that hits this uh, website will not see what's in current value. So extremely important. Um, everyone has their own way of handling secrets, and this is how Postman handles variable secrets. So what's happening here is at the collection level, so I'm here in this collection, I have an authorization tab, and what I'm doing is setting an authorization method at the collection level, which will then be inherited by subsequent folders and requests. So this is a bearer token. I generated an access token from the Databricks dashboard, and now Postman will automatically add the right authorization header formatted as a bearer token with a bearer prefix to every request. So when we head over to one of our calls, which is inside this collection, under the auth tab, you can see that it's inheriting from the collection level auth and under headers, you might have to toggle this on, but you can see that Postman is adding the proper authorization. So that's a little bit of a productivity helper. All right, so we talked about variables, we talked about initial versus current value, we talked about um, how to variables, collection value, the requests. Okay, I'm really kind of dragging my feet, but I think it's time to get to this light here. Okay, so let's close this, let's clean up some of our tabs. And we'll go to the second folder there called automation example. What I'm doing here is I have a post for a long running query. This was the hardest part of this entire demo to build. I don't know what a long running query is. I don't know how long it'll take for something to execute. And so fingers crossed that this takes long enough to show what I want to sell. So remember what I said about wait timeout set to zero. This is how you can set your call to run asynchronously so that you get back a statement ID right away and then you can pull or periodically check for status. Okay, the second call in our, collect, in our folder is gonna be checking the status. And then the third one is gonna be to send a notification. And so I'm using a Google Cloud function that is then triggering um, a server running on this light right here that I hacked using the VM server. Okay, so all I'm doing there is turning it on. So let's, normally you can send a call copy and paste the statement ID, and then paste it into the next call, copy and paste any information, and then so forth. But I'm using scripts. So in the first call in this folder, there is a tab called scripts, and I am writing JavaScript to save information, parse the response from the, re from the server to save a variable called SQL statement ID here, so that I can use it in subsequent requests. 
Similarly, I have a little bit more JavaScript. And if you're not JavaScripty, there is a little like code gen thing where you can insert common bits of code. In the second call, we have a script where we're checking conditional logic on whether to send the notification or wait a bit. In this case, I have a set timeout for one second before I check again. If you expect your query to take five hours, you might set your timeout to be five minutes, check every five minutes or whatever. So once the request, sorry, once the response comes back with status succeeded, then it'll kick off the send notification. So let's try it out. Enough dragging my feet. So I'm gonna run the folder and I can see the three calls in this folder. And I'm just for uh, debugging purposes, I'm gonna check this persist responses for a session and we'll kick it off. Okay, so that long running query immediately kicked off. Did you see how quick that was? Immediately kicked off, return a statement ID to me. And then now the next one in my folder is saying check the status. And you probably can't see what's at the very bottom. Uh, but the last one was send notification. That one hung there for a little bit, about six seconds, because my GCP serverless function took that long. So that turned it on. And this is just a very visual example, but if you're at home, say you have a wearable you wanna hack, say you, you have a digital assistant, or any kind of uh, automation you wanna run. So I didn't realize that I would have to turn this off, but I'll go to my send notification and just update that state to closed. And again, this one takes about six seconds to run. If you have an eagle eye, you'll be able to see at the very bottom uh, the payload size as well as seven seconds. Seven seconds on conference internet, not bad. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to show you in Postman was how do you generate the code? You can run it here in Postman the way I just showed you. However, maybe you have a custom application you're building or maybe you're trying to cobble together bits of logic. So once you have, let's go back to that first call the long running query, which was not so long. Uh, once you have your call working the way you want in Postman on the far right, you can open up the code icon and you can select what programming language you want this in. So in this case, it's curl, run it from command line, but there's a lot of different um, uh, libraries and frameworks that you can use to say, let's say I'm using Python request framework, and then you can copy and paste this. So code generation is really helpful, especially if you don't wanna be writing things in different languages or just to automatically generate. All right, let me head back and wrap up this talk. All right. I did have a video just in case stuff wasn't working, but let's skip through that. So what we did was we submitted our SQL statement, which is either short running or long running. We checked the status. If the status is complete, um, then we can kick off a notification. If it's still pending or running or any other status, it keeps checking and looping there. So the send notification was reaching out to hardware, but this can be anything. There's a ton of software, a ton of different hardware you can integrate into this workflow. Uh, we used a collection level authorization method to automatically add a bearer token to every request in the collection. And we also talked about the importance of initial versus current values, very, very important. We wrote a couple scripts in JavaScript to set and get variable data and also conditionally control the sequence of our API calls. And then we ran our API calls. Uh, and then once our automation is working the way we want, there's a lot of code gen. So here on the top right, you have Postman that has the code gen. There's also examples, which I didn't show you, that shows examples of response payloads. Databricks API reference also has on the left there, I'm showing you that drop down examples of response payloads to help you understand what you might expect. And on the bottom there, there's another code gen. So VM also has machine code in Python, Go, and C++. If you're not like, I'm not really hip with tinkering with hardware, there's code generation there. So a lot of different ways to combine hardware and software, and the combinations are pretty much limitless. So what we did here is we went from Databricks running on, I had AWS, to a Google Cloud uh, Platform serverless function 
to hitting VM server running on an ESP32 board that's like nestled down here. But you could also use a different cloud function. You could use no cloud function at all. You can actually hit the hardware directly. You can swap out the ESP32 for a Raspberry Pi or a Linux machine. Um, and if we're on the go, maybe this isn't gonna be in my office, but it's gonna be with me. Um, maybe you can swap it out for an Android device or any kind of smart light in your office or your home. So the possibilities are endless. And when you're thinking about different ways to automate workflows, definitely consider all the software possibilities, all the things you can access with API, but you can also access hardware with APIs. You can mix and match. All right, so I have a couple additional resources here. One is the Postman collection that you can uh, scan the QR code if you want to fork the collection to your own workspace and try it out. And then the other one is TriVM. That's the server running on this hardware right here. And so the last thing I'll say is that Databricks, look at this freaking huge conference, right? It's a huge, huge conference. It's a fully featured, very rich platform. And yet the simple API, the small but mighty API is the fundamental building block for a lot of the power that you see here. And in the same way, um, you know, VM, VM does a ton of other fancy things. We have machine learning, we have actuation, but being able to talk to a machine is the fundamental building block. So really think about getting to know the basics and then building on it. And if you have any questions about either the API or VM, please do come talk to me afterwards. Thank you.